this video almost didn't happen. You see, this is a Aldi Ferrex hot melt glue gun with a built-in uh, lithium cell, so you can just basically just turn it on and use it. And uh, because it's quite easy to turn on, if you press this button at the back, hold it for a few seconds, it lights up and starts heating up. And because of that, I thought, as a safety precaution, I won't put it in my hold luggage on the plane. I should take it on as hand luggage. And I went through the x-ray machine and they decided it was a gun. Um, but I'm not sure if it's because of my appearance, because I'm like 250 pounds, six foot four, got a big beard. Uh, I just, maybe that's why they thought I was going to weaponize it. I'm just, uh, this is dribbling goo, because I've just turned it on. That's how fast it eats up. Let me demonstrate it by dribbling goo. There is a nice little bead of hot melt glue. There we go. That's the demonstration complete. I shall just turn this off. But anyway, uh, while they were uh, seizing this, they also seized this Dremel tool type thing. I say Dremel, it's a, a clone-ish type Dremel thing. Um, Ferex again from Aldi. I don't, it's one of these things that they get in from time to time. And there were no bits, no pointy bits, nothing, no grinding wheels, anything. It was just this, and I thought that's relatively safe and innocuous. It looks a bit like a lady's toy, and it has exactly the same components, but no... Apparently this was a weapon as well, so uh, I did plead my innocence, and uh, they called the the lady dealing with me called her superior, who turned up in her power suit and announced, no, I could brandish the hot melt glue gun and threaten people. So um, they took them, but they did offer me an opportunity to get them back by paying a special service, which ended up costing twenty pounds, and the two tools did come back. Um, that included a nice healthy cut for the English government in the form of VAT for the value they added to the whole experience. But anyway, let's get on with the video. You've seen it operate now. It is rechargeable. It charges a USB-C port. Um, I will open this up and I'm actually just realising this contains hex screws. So I'm going to pause momentarily while I remove them. One moment, please. The screws are out. Turns out there are Torx type bits. Let's gently ease this apart. I should have mentioned there's another button here that turns a little LED on the front. It also has a slight time delay. Oh, this is not coming apart the way I expected. Okay, here is the charging area. Is this going to actually come apart? I think it is. Yes. Oh. Oh, it's an 18650. This is not surprising. Uh, two little dimps have fallen out, the little light guides for the LEDs. Well, that's reassuring. It's an 18650. What's its capacity? 1,500 milliamp hour. There is scope for boosting up on that. The heater section. We have, but I'll take this apart and explore it. This is where everything will fall apart, won't it? So, um, oh, there's a little switch there on the trigger. That's interesting. Right, tell you what, I shall remove the circuit board and take this apart and we can explore the circuitry. One moment, please. Okay, I have to say that was a longer than average one moment, please. So one day later, because I had to like take a break from this design, then come back to it because it's quite odd. Uh, I shall show you the main components here and then the schematic and why it kind of tripped me up. Now, things worthy of noting this. It looks as though they've soldered the wires onto the end of the lithium cell, but in reality, they've tacked on metal strips. I don't know if they've sold. I think they have soldered afterwards, and they've just used that, that as a solderable surface. That's a bit odd. It, I tried desoldering the positive from this, and it didn't come off, and I was too worried about heating it too much. Um, so I just disconnected it from the circuit board. Uh, so let's take a look at this circuit board. I shall zoom down in this so you can marvel at it in great detail. This side is dedicated to power. So we have the charging circuitry and it's not based on... I thought they might have used uh, one of the little LTH7 type chips for charging, but they've used their own dedicated circuitry here for the charging and monitoring of the uh, charge status. There is also a big fat MOSFET here. It turns out it's switching quite a lot of current potentially. And we've got the microcontroller. Um... All that's on this side, other than that stuff, is uh, just fairly chunky tracks. 
Things are worthy of note. This 100 ohm resistor had me perplexed. It says 1000, but that's 100 with a zero decimal multiplier. And this 200 ohm kind of solved that. Um, there is a MOSFET for charging and there is a uh, NPN transistor for the controlling the MOSFET. Um, it, it's also worth mentioning that the actual the charger circuit board itself has a 0.4 ohm resistor on it, a little sort of shunt resistor, and then two programming resistors that just basically tell smart chargers that they can put power out to this. On the other side of the circuit board is oh one other thing I want to mention about that one. There's two voltage dividers giving an indication of the charge voltage. I'm not sure why. I, I guess one's to trigger the uh, the uh, to let the processor know it is charging, but I'm not sure what the other ones were. Um, on the other side, we've got various bits of circuitry, including uh, this switches the LED on, this transistor, uh, and these two transistors, which I drew a blank in the number, NJ717, that showed up. The closest I could get online was an NPN transistor. They're not, they're MOSFETs, N-channel MOSFETs. So NJ717, not sure. And we've got a couple of bicolor LEDs, red and blue, and a couple of buttons. And we've got the little switch in here to detect when you actually pull the trigger. That's quite interesting that it does that. I'm guessing it just uh, goes into a sort of standby current and then boosts it up when you pull the trigger. Right, let's take a look at the schematic. Anything else worth mentioning here? Well, these, uh, incidentally, these uh, enable things like uh, voltage dividers for monitoring voltage across the MOSFET and also the thermistors. There is a second thermistor position here that is populated with the components required and a common enable circuit, but there's no thermistor in there. It's also quite an odd value of thermistor on the heated head itself. Right, let's go to the schematic and then I'll show you how the uh, actual the heater tip is constructed because it's quite interesting. So here is the USB charge socket. It's got the uh, plus and minus, but it's also got those two voltage uh, in those pins that enable the smart chargers to actually put output in the first place. And there are two 5.1K resistors in those pulled down to the zero volt rail. There is the 0.4 ohm resistor, which I think is mainly to do with limiting current into the lithium cell. There's a little shunt resistor here just to keep make sure that when... The thing is unplugged, it shunts it down quite quickly, I'm guessing, because there are two voltage dividers. And I'm guessing that one is for just telling the processor that it's being charged, and also maybe to monitor voltage on the charging side, which is a bit odd. Not sure. Maybe it detects an over-voltage situation and uh, turns off the MOSFET. I don't really know. Then it can't, because there's a 100 ohm, MOS ohm resistor across that. So when the processor wants to turn on charging, it turns on this little NPN transistor, which pulls the gate of this MOSFET down to the zero volt rail, and that turns it on, and current can flow from the charging circuit into the lithium cell via this Schottky diode. There is a 100 ohm bypass resistor. Initially, I was thinking that's odd, because it means when the MOSFET's turned off, technically speaking, it could keep charging current into the a lithium cell and could overcharge it, but it turns out there's a 200 ohm resistor here and they form a basic potential divider. And uh, what that does, it means that if the processor, if the voltage drops so low that the processor is actually shut down completely, it can still bypass that charge circuit, um, but this will cap the voltage from going too high and it means it can put enough into the lithium cell that the processor can boot. We also saw that, I'm pretty sure, on the Guinness Surger circuit. Quite interesting. Um, and the reason for this transistor down here controlling the MOSFET, I'm guessing, is just because it means that the processor has to do something decisive. It, it has to actually turn on a fairly high current input to this transistor. I say high current, it's 30k resistor, but it has to uh, actively put out a known output high state to actually get that MOSFET to turn on. Let's take a look. Oh, and it's a 1,500 milliamp hour 18650 cell, which is going to have to deliver potentially 10 amps based on my computations. Here's the battery supply rail, and it starts off providing power to the microcontroller via a 20 ohm resistor and a little decoupling capacitor. That decoupled supply is also used for the two clicky push buttons. The clicky push buttons here. And they um, are basically pulling down uh, 51k resistors, one each, 
and then that signal then goes to the processor. So it sees the when the button's pressed, it sees that input go low. The little switch down here for the trigger is normally closed when the trigger's relaxed. Um, and it's only opens when you pull it, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's bridging to the zero volt rail. And I'm guessing the reason for that is that when it, the process is put to sleep, if it turns off its internal pull-ups, then that switch by default is pulling to the zero volt rail and it's a stable input. Uh, there are the LEDs. The two LEDs, red and blue, chip in each. One common resistor for both, so they're either red or blue. Um, they're controlled directly by the microcontroller, and I've just shown one LED here, just like I showed one button there. Uh, the LED in the front that points where you're working, the white LED is a 100-ohm resistor and a little standard NPN transistor and a 10K resistor to that. Then we get to the heater. The heater... I ran it from a bench power supply at 1 volt and it passed 2.5 amps, which suggests a resistance of 0.4 ohms. It was just the easiest way to measure it. That means at round about 4 volts, it's going to pass 10 amps, which is about 40 watts. That's quite high, but it does seem to control it. It looks like it pulses and modulates it, possibly, or just basically cycles it on and off to hover at specific temperatures. Um, the battery voltage itself is monitored by a potential divider. But so the potential divider doesn't risk draining the battery when the unit is not in use, there is a MOSFET that switches that on. And that's controlled by a common output that not only turns that MOSFET on, but also turns on effectively the temperature sensors, the NDC thermistor uh, bridge. Because uh, both the NDC positions have a 10K resistor, a little decoupling capacitor across the thermistor. And I actually measured the thermistor at 187 degrees uh, 187, sorry, kilohms at 10 degrees Celsius, which is quite odd. That makes me wonder if it's a 150K um, NDC thermistor. I'm guessing the reason they've used that one if it, they, for that reason is it's going to mean that at the high temperatures it runs at for the melting the hot melt glue, it's going to bring it down to a fairly low resistance and it's going to bring it into the sweet spot of the processor. Um... The microcontroller can turn on the MOSFET. The MOSFET is also monitored by another separately controlled MOSFET that can put a potential divider across it, and that looks at the voltage drop across the MOSFET. Technically speaking, you could tell if the heater had gone open circuit by seeing the voltage going up to the... or uh, by not seeing the voltage being pulled up to the positive rail when this is off. But I think it's to measure the voltage across the MOSFET because you can get something called thermal runaway with MOSFETs. When a MOSFET gets too hot, its resistance goes up. And then because its resistance has gone up, it gets hotter. And then its resistance goes up higher. And then it gets hotter and the resistance gets higher. And it goes out of control. And it can actually cause failure of the MOSFETs. By having a potential divider across that, 1K and 20K, it can look for a voltage rise across that, possibly. And uh, then that signals back to the microcontroller that the, uh, the MOSFETs probably unstable and that it should actually turn it off right let's take a look at the glue head now because it's quite interesting the heater is this little brown disc brown disc this little white disc and uh, it's got a brass nozzle section the brass nozzle is a, a fairly solid section here. Then uh, the nozzle coming out, but it's got a tapered section here or a, a narrower section, which the silicone sleeve is put over and then a spiral spring is put round to grip it on. There is a thermistor literally just taped onto the side of the brass barrel here with a captain tape. And then the heater this little tiny disc that can put theoretically out 40 watts up, which is quite high, this gets put on the end of that and it gets sandwiched against the end by this disc of sort of rubbery, fibrous stuff. Asbestos. No, probably not. Uh, but I think it's fiberglass reinforced um, rubber. And it gets pushed against that uh, when you put the cover on. It's got a, this end clips on and it pushes it against it. Oh, it is. It's got little uh, ribs in there to basically for thermal isolation. That does two things. It pushes that against the brass block and it also provides a bit of thermal insulation from the plastic. 
Um, it's very interesting, quite an unusual construction and very much dedicated to this specific task. I wasn't expecting. I thought it might ex just use a standard um, PTC type self-regulating thermistor. It's odd that it uses the uh, separate thermistor and this little heating disc. I'm guessing that means that in standby, when you're not pulling the trigger, when you turn it on, it will come up to a certain temperature and then it will cut back. But as soon as it detects you squeezing the trigger, it will just boost the temperature up again, up to the higher level. That will help save the battery and uh, cooking the glue and uh, other things like that. But there we have it. Um, glad that I got it back from the airport authorities. It was quite interesting to take apart, but did take quite some time to uh, reverse engineer because... It's actually quite a complex design. It's very much in the keeping with uh, many of the other Aldi and Lido tools that I reverse engineered. A lot of the circuitry was purely so that when the processor shuts down, it can turn all the auxiliary stuff off and it has a very low standby current. Very interesting, quite a nice little thing.